Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the, what is it, March 7th edition of the Cardiology Grand Rounds. Uh, today, we have a very interesting topic uh, presented by Dr. Kuryachin, uh, Dr. Plaquin, and Dr. Farouk. Uh, they are going to talk on stereotactic radio ablation for cardiac dys dysrhythmias, which is an exciting new technique. So, Thanks, Andrew, and uh, thanks for inviting uh, the three of us to give this grand rounds uh, to the people in the room, as well as people who are. Let's start with you know just acknowledging that we're in the traditional territories of the people of Treaty Seven region in southern Alberta, um, that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, um, the Tsitsima First Nation, the Stony Dakota, as well as the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation. My disclosure, they're usually with industries that are affiliated with EP or uh, algae or uh, Medicaid. Nick has no disclosures and uh, get one disclosure with Snow. Obviously, we're going to get into a lot of detail about stereotactic radio ablation for dysrhythmias, but I'll sort of start with saying, you know, this is a very novel treatment for arrhythmias that's come about in the last few years. Initially, there were some animal um, studies and looking at animal models. And the human data really started to come out probably in the last 10 to 12 years, initially to some case reports and some smaller studies. And they're usually looking at patients who had refractory VT, who kind of failed other management such as antiarrhythmics and ablation. Talk a little bit about the arrhythmia mechanisms. I think that's gonna be a little bit to sort of keep in mind as we go through this talk. So the VT that we're talking about is sort of structural VT. What that means is there's a scar in the ventricle. You know, the most common reason is a prior myocardial infarction. Uh, and when you have a scar, you know, most of us think it's sort of a dormant, you know, completely dead scar, but that's not true. There are parts of it that are not completely dead that can have electrical conduction and sort of properties that make it a setup for reentrant arrhythmias. We call them border zones where there's not truly a dead scar, but they're not truly healthy tissue either. There are also other kind of arrhythmias that happen in the ventricle because of automaticity triggered activity. Uh, and micro reentry, but those don't apply to this kind of uh, scar mediated mechanism that we're going to be focusing on. This is sort of a cartoon image of what happens. So, this is actual left ventricle and myocardial sort of cross section. Um, and this depicts the, the scar area. And you can kind of see the arrows kind of marching through there. Sorry, the animation is not playing that well. <clears throat> But the idea is that there are areas in the border zone where you can have reentrant arrhythmias happen. Um, and typically, this is a combination of having a substrate or the right kind of scar, along with perhaps other precipitating factors like myocardial ischemia, electrolyte disturbances, CHF. Um, but a lot of times, as you know, when patients come in VT and they've had a prior MI and scar, we don't always know what that reason was. Most of these patients with structural heart disease and ventricular tachycardia have a defibrillator that's implanted, and the defibrillator can give them shocks. Also, deliver pacing therapies called ATP, uh, anti tachycardia pacing, to get them out of the ventricular tachycardia. Um, and you might say, well, if they've got an ICD, well, then, you know, problem solved, but not really because the shocks are quite painful. And ATPs can also be sometimes symptomatic. They may get lightheaded depending on the programming. So, although they have an ICD, we actually really want to minimize the treatment they get from the ICD. So, you know, how do we suppress the VT? So beta blockers are almost ubiquitously used in these patients because they have LV dysfunction. Um, typically, we start in amiodarone uh, as the common sort of path. Certainly, when they come in VT storm, there are some IV options to look at as well. And a lot of them end up being on a combination of usually amiodarone plus beta blocker. And then if they're going home, maybe mixilatine as well. Um, if the amiodarone was enough to kind of settle things. The times that we use catheter ablation, especially in Canadian centers, is probably pretty conservative compared to maybe some other areas. Uh, for the most part, we're usually doing catheter ablation for ventricular tachycardia in patients that have already gotten antiarrhythmics and are still having VT, or maybe they're not tolerating antiarrhythmics or had side effects. Uh, or sometimes they're in sort of VT storm and we're not just not able to sell them at all with uh, anterior. There are other you know, reasons for sort of indication for catheter ablation that are sort of related to this, but in terms of VT, the other main time we consider is, um, you know, people are failed with anterior mix, but also in some cases, if their EF is 
um, not that bad, maybe using ablation as an alternative to antiarrhythmics, even if they have not failed it or tried one. The ablation procedure, as most of you know, is done in the electrophysiology lab. Um, it tends to be quite a long procedure, usually about five to eight hours, depending on the VT and sort of the condition of the patient. Typically, we do it under a general anesthetic because it is a quite a long procedure. The success rates are about 50 to 60% over sort of a two-year time period, and the complication rates about 1% to 5%, and death probably in the point 0.1 to 1%. Not just because of the procedure itself, because we're doing this on pretty sick patients. So if you can imagine somebody with a EF of 15% and NYHA4 who's in because of a VT storm undergoing a you know six-hour GA procedure, you know, it's not unusual to see that there's complications that can happen. In the lab, if we can induce the VT and if it's stable, we can study it, but we can also look at what the scar areas are by using voltage uh, with our catheters in the heart to identify scar and identify circuits that might be playing a role and then ablate them. Um, you know, there are certainly limitations to ablation as well. So this is the same slide I showed earlier. So we had kind of said that, um, you know, the part here is sort of where the fibrosis is from the possibly myocardial infarction. And the two kind of yellowish regions that you see where the arrows are pointing are actually ablation lesions that were created from ablation on this person. On the right panel, you can see that when we do ablation with our catheter, it, you know, the, how deep we go is actually pretty minimal. It's about maybe half a centimeter plus or minus a little bit, depending on the catheter and the technology systems you have. So you can imagine if you have a left ventricle that's quite thick, even if you go epicardially and ablate endocardial, there may be areas that you can never reach with ablation. So you can see how some circuits may not be interrupted with ablation at all. Um, and as you can imagine, there are probably parts of the heart you just can't target well with ablation just because of their anatomic relation. Like you can imagine that on top of the arrow here, you know, because of those pat muscle or other structures, you may never be able to sort of target that area properly. Um, and going back to the previous discussion, you know, because it is a long procedure and you have sick patients, sometimes the patient may not be you know, well enough to undergo an ablation procedure. Um, unless you sort of start adding mechanical support and then that comes with sort of its own sort of set of complications. So you end up with a lot of patients who really have not much options when you reach this stage. Um, you know, sometimes they, you know, I've had patients who've then sort of chosen palliative care. Some have actually used MAID. Um, so it is a pretty sick group of patients. So there's always been interest in looking at other ways to provide treatment. So in the last 10 to 12 years, this is, sort of started coming about. So some people kind of said, well, you know, our uh, oncology colleagues deliver radiation to get rid of tumors. You know, what if we radiate the scar? Would that change the characteristics and get rid of ventricular tachycardia? Um, few case reports, but the group that's really been ahead of this is the Wash U group in St. Louis. So Philip Kuklich, who's the EP doctor, and Cliff Robinson, who's the um, uh, on radiation oncologist, they initially published on five patients and subsequently on 19 patients. Um, and again, it's the kind of patients that we would probably consider doing here as well. So pretty sick patients who had prior ablation, still having VT on antiarrhythmics. Um, and you can see the, you know, the curve, the results are pretty impressive. So if you look at the number of VT episodes from the blue shows the, what the episodes were before the ablation for each, treat, for each patient, and the red is after. If you look at survival, it's about 72% at 12 months. That's not surprising for this group of patients. That's probably what we would expect. Um, there were no real major complication. You know, some had pericarditis and pneumonitis, and that's not unusual with radiation therapy. Um, as we sort of started to get interested in this, we actually did a review article, and since there have been a few other review articles on this as well. Um, you know, the latest kind of data shows that, again, the number of publications are small, and the number of patients are still small. The biggest one is still that one from Kukulich with 19 patients. There is currently a European registry kind of forming together, and I suspect when they publish, they'll have, you know, probably 80 to 100 or more patients, but that's still sort of coming down. It's not really a study. It's really more of a registry kind of setup that's coming. If you look at the results, you know, like any new therapies, the first two studies obviously had the most impressive results, and then you sort of see that kind of, you know, diverge, commonly seen a lot of intervention studies. Um, again, the complication you know, our sort of pericarditis, heart failure, possibly a stroke, although this one wasn't clear if it was related, um, and, you know, nausea, vomiting. So if you, you know, there's about 80 patients here, and if you did 80, it took these 80 patients who were quite sick and did catheter ablation, 
you know, the major complication rate would probably be, you know, a bit higher. So compared to catheter ablation, this actually looks good. Um, you know, this data is pretty recent, but when locally we started looking at this, uh, you know, it is concerning that, you know, one study, of course, had no reduction, but then if you, you have to start wondering, you know, is there sort of a publication bias or other, you know, centers that have negative experiences just not publishing? A lot of centers do this on a compassionate care basis, uh, not a study. And you can imagine if you did one or two patients and it didn't go well, you kind of stop it and you don't necessarily publish it. So locally, we kind of felt that we don't want to use the compassionate care strategy and we really want to do this as a study. So we're looking at outcomes. Even if you argue that, hey, maybe it has very minimal benefit and minimal complications, the reality is we are taking up time uh, for radiation therapy, which is the necessary therapy for cancer patients. They have a wait list. So we want to make sure we're using resources appropriately. Uh, like many you know, projects, especially when it involved uh, collaboration between different groups, it took a while to, to set up, you know, sort of started doing this in 2018 when I was actually at, I think, some sort of leadership meeting and uh, Nick's boss, who was the head for med physics, was there and we started talking and I said, hey, there's this thing happening. Uh, and then she sort of put us in touch with uh, uh, Nick and then also someone who's the rad onk. Um, and, you know, since then, Libin was actually pretty helpful in getting us a grant to kind of start this up. Uh, then obviously went through ethics. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this stuff ended up happening through COVID. So it obviously limited, you know, patient enrollment and things like that. So we've done about three patients so far, and we'll talk about those. Um, so this is sort of the steady plan. And, you know, with the idea is sort of the same. You have patients with structural heart disease who have um, monomorphic VT and had, you know, prior attempted cardiac ablation or are not candidates because they're quite sick um, and, you know, have sort of failed antiarrhythmics. This is sort of the typical case. This is, I think, one of, I think this might've been our second patient, 62 year old gentleman with ischemic cardiomyopathy. He's got a single chamber ICD. Uh, he had an occluded RCA with an inferior MI, a severe LV dysfunction, no heart failure. And he actually underwent a VT ablation in the, in the US and uh, unfortunately had some complications with that procedure. Um, and since then he still continued to have VT. So he was on amiodarone, mixilatine, and then uh, carvedilol by the, you know, by the time we were considering him for this. And he would often get VT with ATP from his ICD that he find quite bothersome. Um, and he really didn't want another catheter ablation because of prior experience. And he just felt that, you know, it was a lot to go through and he really was adamant not to do that. But he was also not happy with sort of the, the VT. Um, so as we go through the next little bit, so what we want to keep in mind is, you know, how do we combine our data is a big aspect of uh, this procedure. Uh, what we use is similar to what the WashU group is using the 17 segment model for the heart. What we want to do is integrate all the information we have to figure out what areas do you want to target so that, you know, VT, ECGs, you know, any electrophysiology study information, as well as imaging data. Uh, so for this person, we know from his ablation in the, in the U.S. that, you know, the targets they ended up doing in the SCAR were kind of in the uh, mid and basal inferior regions. Uh, we also have echo wall motion data that includes that and surrounding regions, um, along with uh, we did a, what's called the NIPS, a non-invasive program stemmed through the ICD. It's where we can use the ICD lead to actually induce VT and sort of study it in the EP lab. Um, and this is the VTV induce. I mean, it's not clear if this was the only one he had, but this seemed, the cycle length seems similar. And you want to be generous in the area you select because you don't want to just focus on one area and miss sort of the other crucial channels that may be nearby. Because what we see on the 12 lead is really the exit of the VT. It doesn't really address the channel and the, and the border scars as much. Uh, we also have data, um, you know, all these patients have an ICD. So, you know, some of them have an MRI conditional ICD. It's very easy to get the MRI. If they have a non-MRI conditional, we do have a legacy protocol we can use. and um, you're still limited because there's more sort of artifactual uh, things that happen with the imaging. Um, and then the idea is to correlate that with the reference CT that the Radonk department does. So we can, we're sort of, you know, comparing apples to apples in terms of target. Uh, and Bobby, Hidari, and Naeem Merson have been hugely helpful in this. They're sort of the, uh, you know, our translation of imaging to where to, uh, from our cardiac imaging to the reference CT. In this patient, we sort of selected, again, you know, we want to be a bit generous with the targets. So we're not missing critical areas. Um, and then I'll sort of hand off to uh, Oman Faruqi, who's going to talk about the radiation aspects. Uh, 
All right, hope everyone can hear me okay. And I don't think I can use my, you can see my mouse, so that's perfect. Okay, so my, you know, my role today is really to uh, speak about radiation therapy in a general sense. I realize a lot of us here have, may not have had exposure uh, to uh, radiation medicine. So uh, let's get right to it. There it is. So radiation has been an effective tool for treating cancer for over a hundred years and about half of all cancer patients will receive radiation as part of their treatment. And most patients are receiving treatment uh, on a linear accelerator, which is what's pictured here, treated with photons. When we look back at the history of radiation therapy, x-rays were described as far back as 1895, Willem Röntgen, and this is a picture of his wife's hand there, first medical use in the Lancet in 1896 to loca locate a knife in the spine of a stabbed sailor. The first use to treat cancer was in 1896 when, they, when it was used to treat a mole, which disappeared following x-ray treatment. And then Becquerel described radioactivity in 1898. And to put things in perspective, penicillin wasn't discovered till 1928, so a long history of uh, radiation medicine. Uh, basics and terminology. So any uh, therapeutic radiation is ionizing. For most patients, we're talking about photons, so it's indirectly ionizing, and we'll talk about that in a second. But we do have access uh, to charged particle or electron uh, radiation therapy as well. Um, and when we treat patients, we usually put them on a unit and we treat them with six to 18 megavolt energy. The higher the megavoltage, the deeper uh, depth of penetration for radiation uh, for dose deposition. When we think about how we measure dose, we measure it in a unit called gray. So for cardiac radioablation, we're treating patients with 25 gray in a single fraction. But it's important to remember it's not just the total gray that matters, it's also the gray per day. So 25 gray delivered over a single session is very different than delivered over 10 sessions, for example in terms of its biologic effects. So this is just a, uh, a rough uh, view of what a linear accelerator looks like. Uh, essentially, it's uh, connected to a power supply, which then powers this electron gun, which shoots out electrons, accelerates them towards a target. When they hit the target, they change direction. And when they change direction, they release radiation and, and Bremsterong radiation. This radiation is then filtered and, uh, and then targeted towards the patient as photon energy. Once it enters the patient, it's then converted back into electrons, which are once again the charged particles that do the downstream biologic effects. So for cancer medicine, the, the basis of radiation therapy, uh, the target of damage is the DNA molecule. Radiation causes single and double-stranded DNA breaks. And when the cells are trying to divide, they die during mitotic cell death. And both normal and cancer cells are affected, but normal cells can repair better uh, in between each session. That's why typically we treat patients over many days. In cardiac radiation, of course, we don't have cancer cells, so we don't need to treat them over many days. We just treat it over a single session. Now, why, is, why are we getting the effects that we're seeing uh, in VTAC with uh, radiation? The short answer is we don't know, but based on how short uh, of a time interval it takes for it to be effective, it likely has nothing to do with DNA damage or fibrosis, likely affecting the microenvironment of the myocytes and altering the refractory periods and conduction velocities uh, due to changes in gap junctions and connections. And basically, at every conference, there's new theories, and it's really fascinating science. So the radiation oncology team, so there's a, there's a lot of people that are involved in uh, going from uh, plan to actually being able to deliver it, including a uh, physician, myself, our nursing staff. Then we have uh, a medical physicist, and Dr. Plokhan can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then, of course, we have the radiation therapy team. And these are individuals who have a separate training program. Uh, for radiation therapy. The dosimetry team essentially uh, will create the plan we ask them to create. So we'll say, this is the dose we want, and, and they will sort of figure out the beam arrangements. And then the radiation therapists themselves are day-to-day -day going to help us uh, align the patient to the machine, make sure that the imaging is uh, telling us everything is okay to go. Uh, so this is sort of the whole team that we have. <clears throat> So, so once I see a patient in consult, the next step is I'll arrange for a simulation to happen. And this usually happens within about a week or so, and we'll talk about that in a second. Once the simulation is done, then I'll put on my contours or the target delineation. And you know, Dr. Kriach and Dr. Pokan and I and radiology will work together to create the target. But once the target is done, this will typically go down to dosimetry. Uh, these are once again, the radiation therapy staff that will plan the treatment. Uh, once that treatment is planned, it'll go for quality assurance, usually with physics to make sure that it's deliverable. And then finally, the patient can start treatment. And usually from consult to starting treatment, our uh, provincial average is somewhere around three weeks. And then treatment, of course, can last for any duration of time. So the goal of simulation is to do a CT scan with the patient using the immobilization device. We want them to use day-to-day. -day. And the goal of the immobilization is to reduce both inter and intrafraction motion. 
by creating a comfortable reproducible position for the patient. At the time of simulation, we can place tattoos to help us line them up day to day on the unit. And if we have access to other imaging, like a previous CT scan, PET scan, MRI, we can fuse that at the time of planning to use the, the best of uh, all the imaging that we have. So that's a quick introduction to radiation therapy. And I'll talk briefly now about the radiation technology and, um, and where we've come from and where we are. So radi radiation has really benefited from the uh, sort of computer revolution that's happened over the last 50 years or so. Uh, and uh, and VTAC uh, treatment certainly takes advantage of the latest that we have to offer. But going back in time, you know, initially radiation started out as 2D radiotherapy. So what you see here is the radiation head. And to block the dose from going to the kidneys, staff would have to go into the room and place a physical block to uh, prevent dose from going into the kidneys, for example. So this was the 2D era where we did uh, sort of simple plans. Uh, this is one of the older radiation machines. This is, used to be called the cobalt machine, and uh, we don't use these anymore, but I just want to highlight that uh, Canada had a big role in the development of one of these radiation machines, and we still play a, a big role in radiation medicine compared to our size and population. So the first cobalt machine was created in Sask Saskatchewan and first patient treated in London, Ontario. So this is a sort of simple uh, single field that's placed on the back of the patient. So what we're seeing here, the red is sort of the high dose, the blue is the low dose. And as you can see, there's a skin sparing effect and then the dose peaks around a centimeter to three centimeters in the patient and then it sort of slowly falls off. So this is your most simple uh, one field radiation therapy. Now we've added a second field at the front of the patient. And here, basically, if you look at the 100% isodose line, it's a rectangle. So now we're treating an even amount uh, through the patient by just using two fields in the front and the back. And we can do a lot with these two field arrangements, including up to today, we're still treating breast cancer patients with two fields. So here you're seeing a field that's placed on each side. And because there's a difference in tissue separations uh, anteriorly, there's a wedge placed to account for that difference in separation. So we can get a pretty good plan just using wedges and simple fields. This is a head and neck patient, same thing. You've got two fields coming in, wedges, and you can get a nice dose distribution, uh, which then falls off. Uh, and really to highlight uh, the changes that we've seen. So on the left, you see a traditional 3D CRT plan. You're seeing the wedges and you're seeing sort of three fields. And this plan was presumably placed by a planner who decided that we're going to use this wedge or this dose through each angle. And the 50% isodose line, so if we prescribe 60 gray, then the 30 gray is what you see in green here. Now compare that to a modern technique where you can see how the 50% is really hugging the tumor much more closely. And, and really that's the evolution uh, that we've had over the last 10 years. And and, and, um, and this is sort of what we think of as inverse planning. So this is a computer generated plan. And we're just gonna take a quick look at what that looks like in real time. So instead of having blocks in place, now the shielding is done by what's known as multi-leaf collimators. They are these metal alloys that we'll see in just a second here at the, at the front of the machine. So these uh, metal alloys are gonna be modulating the beam throughout its entire trajectory. The beam is always on as it's rotating around the patient, which allows us to reduce treatment time. And, and as you can imagine, no one person came up with all these beam arrangements. This is computer generated. It spits back, spits, spits back a plan at us. And then we say, is it good or is it not? And then, we, and then we edit it. But basically this is sort of the modern day treatment. And you can see we can do tracking to lung motion using um, external markers so that we treat in a certain phase of respiration like expiration, for example, which further allows us to reduce margins. So the ability to treat with a, a computer generated plan was the first big advance that's happened. Another big advance that's happened is the ability to use imaging before we treat patients. So the more accurate we are, the smaller the margins we can use, and therefore the more the dose we can escalate. And this is a cone beam CT. Essentially, it's a mini CT scan that's done several times for, uh, for our VTAC patients during their treatment to ensure that we're still on target. Uh, of course, because of its resolution, it's limited mainly to making sure we're adapting to position. It can't tell us the exact uh, organ location within. But, but image guidance has been the next big evolution, uh, revolution in radiation. And what's coming next, we have a MR Linux 2 that is scheduled for the new cancer center. Essentially, uh, th these are sort of thought to harboring a new era of radiation, adaptive radiation therapy. And the idea is that instead of just creating a plan and then delivering it, uh, we create an initial plan. But when the patient comes in for treatment, we image them with an MRI scan. So for example, if a cardiac patient doesn't have an ICD and we can actually use the MRI on them, then we would get an MRI scan before treatment we can in real time see the position of the stomach. If the stomach is closer to the heart, for example, we can immediately replan on the fly right before delivering dose. So it allows us to adapt the plan day to day based on organ position. Uh, and it's great for structures where, including upper GI or the heart where CT is not good for visualization. 
Now, I just wanted a brief comment on terminology. So stereotactic radiosurgery in the past uh, used to refer to gamma knife, basically. That was the only real form of radiosurgery. Over the last 10 to 20 years, it's become a much broader number of machines that can deliver it. So now when we say radiosurgery, we're really referring to highly conformal image-guided radiation delivered in one to five sessions. So just a high dose per day, image-guided. Uh, acronyms that have been used, SBRT, SABER for extracranial, SRS for intracranial. And now we have a new acronym, STAR, stereotactic arrhythmia radioablation, but really it's all the same thing we've seen already, image guidance and VMAT technique. A brief note on implanted devices. So uh, we do have guidance documents uh, that have sort of uh, given us some constraints of what we can get away with, with pacemakers and ICDs, for example. In this document, they mentioned as long as the pacemaker dose doesn't exceed two gray, for the most part, it should be safe to deliver. Um, and of course, at 10 to 30 gray, we can see catastrophic failure. For ICDs, it's a lower threshold of 0.5 gray that's estimated to be safe. Uh, either way, we can measure the dose in, uh, in vivo, so we can actually place a device on top of the patient at the time of radiation to make sure it's getting the dose we estimate it to be getting. And one other note, uh, you know, when we're thinking about um, devices, we really want to use energies that are less than 10 megavolts. At 10 megavolts or greater, we end up uh, causing neutron production, which is a, basically a, a byproduct of high energy radiation. And this is by itself not terribly harmful, but it can affect the circuitry of a pacemaker. So uh, for all our patients with VTAC, we use six megavolted energy to minimize uh, the interaction of neutrons uh, with medical devices. And that's all I have for you today. I'll hand it over to Dr. Flopin. All right, so, um, so I'm Nick Ploquin, so I am a medical physicist, so I'm sure uh, most of you have never heard about what a medical physicist is, so, uh, so I just wanted to give you a brief, uh, just brief overview of what, uh, what our role is in the uh, oral radiotherapy process. So um, basically we look into the technical side of, uh, of radiation treatment and uh, uh, we help with the implementation of like new radiotherapy technique too. And like, uh, so STAR was like one of, uh, one of the, the big ones we've done recently. Uh, we're mostly responsible for the safety of uh, and the precision and accuracy of all the radiation treatment. So before going to uh, on the bed, the, the, all the plans are checked by us usually. Uh, we are also responsible for, uh, for ensuring that, uh, that the equipment used in, uh, in, uh, in radiation therapy is, is all calibrated correctly, is used uh, precisely and safely. So uh, lots of work goes like behind the scene like, uh, to make sure that those, uh, those, those equipment are actually like, uh, uh, safe to use uh, for, for patient treatment. Okay, so uh, Salman already talked about uh, the, the, in the general like radiation therapy process. So I just want to uh, put that into context with the, uh, uh, the STAR VT workflow. So uh, after the patient has been considered for STAR, uh, as uh, Salman said, like it, uh, the patient will get some imaging. So one of the imaging we get, it's, uh, it's our own like treatment playing CT. And I'll, I have a few, uh, a few slides uh, about this later, but uh, um, oh, this went blank here. Okay, there you go. Um, so yeah, so after the, the patient, yeah, get considered for stars, like uh, the, the playing city is done. That's uh, the playing city that will be used for uh, those calculations for contouring. Um, and uh, that's um, one that we need to, uh, to be able to, uh, to calculate the dose. Um, so um, the scar contouring is done uh, with um, usually the radio radiologist, uh, um, uh, the EP is there, uh, physics is there and then uh, radiation oncology. So uh, big multidisciplinary meeting that uh, goes on to, uh, to determine where the, the location of the scar is gonna be. Uh, after the scar is contoured, um, as Simon said, it goes to uh, either dosimetry or like uh, physics for planning. So we would take care to plan those cases because they're quite complex uh, uh, in physics and uh, to make sure that we can deliver the appropriate like dose to the, uh, to the uh, to the target uh, and keep it very conformal while avoiding like any critical structure in, in close proximity. Um, there's one step I'm not showing here between planning and treatment, it's the, the QA. So that's one thing that uh, medical physics also take care is making sure that one, the plan is deliverable. We can actually like, you know, like send that plan on the machine and deliver it in a safe way. And, uh, and, and we also check for every patient that the dose that is actually planned by the computer or treatment planning system is actually uh, um, um, match what we what we plan. So what we deliver is actually going to match what we plan. 
So we do uh, lots of uh, measurement uh, calculation to make sure that uh, uh, what, what we get at the end of uh, uh, the time of treatment will match what, what we plan. And then the patient goes for treatment, and I'll talk about this. All right, in terms of imaging, uh, so uh, this is this was actually our first patient. It's not the, the case that uh, Vikas presented, but they're all uh, scanned in the same way. So um, so this, this is our like uh, city room there. Um, uh, so again, the scan is used for planning purpose for us. Uh, um, the patient is immobilized in a very reproducible way because we have to be able to put the patient exactly in the same position at the time of treatment, okay? So um, the scan is really done with contrast. Um, and then what you can see here is that the patient has a compression bridge. So um, the reason for this, um, again, there's no, we're still running a study on that. It's like to, to try to, uh, uh, limit the uh, uh, the extent of the uh, of the heart motion. Um, of course, we can't stop the cardiac uh, cardiac motion, but like the uh, breathing motion can be reduced. So um, we have actually a study running, uh, looking at uh, the the use of the compression device uh, uh, versus using non compression. So those patients are scanned twice, like was one with the compression and one without the compression. And then uh, one of my grad students actually like looking at uh, if, if it does make a difference, because if we don't have to use the scan, uh, the, the compression device, that's, uh, that's a huge win. Uh, as you can see, it's really uncomfortable for the patient. It does, uh, it does, it does work very well for any lung lesion uh, to reduce the, the, the extent of the, the motion of the lung lesion, but uh, we don't have any evidence that it would work for like uh, uh, for the heart. Uh, so after a patient scan, so uh, it goes to treatment planning. So Salman already talked about the contouring, um, uh, things like this. So, but uh, in order to create the plan, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, um, into this. Uh, so as Salman said, we use a micro multi-leaf collimator that has to be optimized through a very complex optimization process uh, to deliver the target, uh, the dose around the target volume in a very conformal way to try to avoid to uh, irradiate any like critical structure in close proximity and try to keep the dose to the actual target. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, someone mentioned that the gantry also rotates around the patient. Uh, we deliver radiation at the rate, so it's a very high dose rate. Um, uh, so it's about 12 grade per minute. So uh, you can give a really big amount of radiation in a very short amount of time. Um, our machine can go all the way to actually like uh, 24 gray per, per minute, but uh, we don't use the high dose, high, dose, uh, uh, high energy uh, beam uh, for the reason Salman mentioned the neutron productions. And then this issue with the, uh, the high dose rate that, uh, that um, the pacemaker can, can handle or the high CD. Um, yeah, so in terms of, uh, so that's just a, a screenshot of the, uh, the, the, the optimization window. So we have to, um, the, so physics and dosimetry play with like the, all those parameters to make sure that we can create like the most optimum plan. Um, it usually takes uh, uh, quite a bit of time to, to do this. Okay, I'll show you. So this is a video of it works of the treatment planning process. Okay, all right. So, uh, so that's the, like a, the scan of like our second patient that uh, uh, Vic has presented. Um, so, um, so the scan is acquired uh, in three dimensions. So we have a, about one millimeter slice thickness, and then um, the the contour is done um, um, with the multidisciplinary group. So, uh, following the the seventeen segment uh, uh, model, so um, the the contour is done. So you can see it on the three on the three plane here. And then what we do is we add a margin to it. Uh, so you'll see it in a second. Um, around that target volume. And the reason for this, it's because this is an average CT. So uh, we have to make sure we account for the fact that the heart is actually moving, uh, like, uh, and, uh, and the patient is breathing, things like that. So we have between two and five millimeter uh, margin, depending on the, on the patient, uh, added to, uh, to the target volume. Uh, we also contour like, uh, so, so the ER will, uh, will contour all the critical structures. So for that case, that was very tricky. We had the stomach right abutting against the, uh, the, the, the heart. And of course, the, the uh, the lesion, the, the scar was like right at that level. So um, pretty complex at that point. Uh, so I just put like the esophagus and the stomach here, but uh, there's many more uh, uh, stri critical structure we, con we, we contour. And then we create the plan. So in that case, we have like, uh, um, so that's one of the beam that will be delivered. We have usually four beams, uh, typical uh, treatment for those, uh, those patients, um, four like uh, beam going around the patient. 
um, and then you're gonna see the MLC. So that's the so that again that's the beam's eye view from the the, the perspective of the Linac. Uh, so you can see how the the MLC. So that's the actual treatment. Uh, the MLC are basically conforming around the uh, the scar and then trying to avoid like some of the uh, um, critical structure like the stomach or esophagus in that case. Okay, so. Um, so yeah, so a very complex optimization process goes into that to determine the pattern of MLC leaves that uh, that uh, that would happen, that would be needed to uh, to create that that plan. Um, I think so. Okay, so after that, like uh, the after the, the computer is going to give you a solution of like what after many iteration of what the dose should be. So this is just a, a representation of the of the dose distribution. Uh, so we prescribed 25 gray. So as uh, Simon mentioned, so uh, the dose wash there, like is the 25 gray as those lines. So um, the blue one uh, would be the, uh, the the 25 contour, and then uh, what's a bit um, darker is the the, the higher dose. Um, where well, you can see how conformal it is, and you'll notice that there's like area like. Uh, like here where like it's not completely covered. The reason for this is because we're right next to the stomach, right? So we want to make sure we don't exceed the toxicity for, for the stomach. So we had to compromise on the target coverage. Um, this is the one, the 10 gray eyes of those lines. So you can see a big chunk of the heart is actually receiving some consequent dose uh, over the whole treatment. So, um, so just uh, again, in the other plans, you can see how like, uh, a conformally, we were able to to get that twenty five as those gray uh, with uh, with the current modern technique we have in, uh, in radiation therapy. Uh, those are fairly large volume. Again, um, I think this was was actually seventy three cc. I think one forty was a bit overestimating uh, um, for this case. Um, so compared to usually what volume we give in radiation therapy for brain meds, which are a very common technique to treat uh, with SRS, it's like 0.1 to 0.2 cc. So when we started that, uh, uh, yeah, everybody in physics and kind of started freaking out a bit. So, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's working so far. I mean, Vekas can show you the results. So, but uh, yeah, that's very unusual. And uh, as you can think, like it's, uh, it's, it was very scary to, to, to try to do that. So lots of like quality assurance and control went into that. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, okay. So before the patient would go for treatment, I said that I'm not going to talk about it, but there's a lot of like, uh, um, check that goes on, like making sure the dose is correct, uh, that we can deliver it. And it's actually, um, delivering what we predicted. And this goes on for every patient that we treat in the, in the center. Um, and the, no exception for this one. Um, and then following that, the patient come for treatment. Um, so one thing that's absolutely critical is that we hit the target uh, 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 correctly, right? Uh, that we hit the right place with the radiation. So there are many safeguards in place and including the imaging that we do pre-treatment. So uh, we have what we call the onboard imager uh, and, um, and Simon had a very nice uh, uh, movie showing like uh, the, the panel deploying. So that can take like a, like a mini CT of the, the patient before treatment. And we can compare that directly to our planning CT to make sure that it's actually like the, the, right, uh, the right dose at uh, the right location. So that's another quick movie showing you like, so that's uh, the time of registration. So like at that point, everybody's at the unit. We just set up the patient. We've imaged the patient uh, just before we turn the beam on. And uh, we've acquired like a... Um, uh, Cone beam CT, so that's the one that has the high, low quality. You can see the artifacts from the from the ICD leads and everything. So, uh, and then we're trying to match. Uh, so, in for that case, the heart, of course, uh, making sure it's at the right place. Uh, the stomach is, you know, where it's supposed to be. Uh, esophagus, things like this. Uh, I've only have the stomach displayed here, but uh, we look at other clinical structure too. Um, so we have a tolerance of like less than a millimeter in terms of like uh, setup accuracy. So it's very accurate. So uh, we can actually set up all our patient to sub millimeter accuracy on, the, on this machine. So uh, 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 lots of work goes on to make sure that uh, those machines can perform to that, that level. So then the patient goes uh, go for treatment. So what we do, uh, we basically set him up exactly the same way that we had the patient uh, uh, at the time of uh, uh, of scanning. So uh, you can see he's exactly in the same position with the compression bridge on, um, and then everybody get out of the room. Um, 
when we deliver the radiation. Um, that was for the second patient. So the, the whole team is there. Uh, notice that the case is the further away from, from everything. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like uh, lots of people were on, but uh, um, this lasts about maybe two minutes, like the, the treatment, so it's very quick uh, in terms of delivery. So no uh, uh, imaging is the, the, what takes the, the, the longest in that page. Um, so yeah, so if we go back to our like uh, uh, study case, so uh, again, uh, Vikas shows the, the lesion that uh, the, uh, the scar location. So that's just uh, showing you on the right side there, like uh, where the, the lesion was. So that's the, the red contour there. And then you can see the isodose distribution uh, displayed on it. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I have for this. So Vikas, you want to take it back from there for showing the result. So yeah, he's gonna talk about some of our like outcomes. There you go. Nick and Salman. Um, so yeah, you know, we've done three patients so far. This is just uh, a quick look at the, the data. Um, I put six months prior and six months after because I thought that was probably a relevant time frame for most of us to look at. But you know, as most of you know, patients don't show up with you know 20 episodes spread out over six months. It's usually in the last month or last few weeks is when things are happening. Um, so all three patients, you know, had sort of treatments as we described, and you can see there is a reduction in uh, VT episodes after. The third patient was pretty recent, hasn't quite hit the six week mark. Um, and again, with a lot of these patients, like he, for example, he actually had 45 ATP episodes the day after treatment. Uh, so we actually added mexilatine to amiodarone and other medications. In most of us you, who use mexilatine, we know it's not that great a, a medication, but uh, we actually called him last week because we knew the presentation was coming up and he really hasn't felt anything since then. So I think after the 45 things settled down, I um, mean, if you're a non-believer, you would say, well, it's all the mexilatine. But for those of you who use mexilatine, we would say it probably isn't. Um, but again, with any of these, you know, when you're doing a treatment, when somebody's at their worst, you know, there's a good chance things are going to get better because you're throwing so many kind of things at them. Uh, but at least it presents an option, you know, for patients with really very minimal other options. Um, you know, we think there is a lot more evidence needed from studies. Um, one of the limitations for this, a lot of centers, because they're doing it as compassionate care, they sort of feel that's what they're gonna keep doing. There's been attempts in the US as well as in Canada looking at randomized studies. Um, you know, who you randomize is the other you know, question, like at what point stage do you say this is the, this versus what? Um, the US uptake for this has been kind of minimal. Um, probably reflects the, the healthcare system there because for you know each of these patients are probably about five to 10 hours of work from the EP side, putting things together, meeting, going through everything. And the EP docs kind of, they say that, well, if I'm doing five to 10 hours of work and I'm not even doing the ablation, then you know why am I involved? And that's certainly not encouraged in their departments to do that kind of work unless they're in a very highly academic environment where there's you know inquiry into this. Uh, you know, so far the side effect sort of profile seems pretty minimal, especially when you compare it to actually catheter ablation. Um, and, you know, one of the things we, it's unfortunate, but the reality in a lot of these patients have pretty limited prognosis. And, you know, this is probably almost like a palliative kind of treatment. So, you know, they're probably not gonna live long enough to have other side effects from the radiation itself. But if you start doing this on younger patients, then, you know, this becomes a very relevant question. Um, and the other you know, concern is there is a lot of unanswered questions, right? The mechanism is still not completely clear. Um, you know, going back to what you know, Salman was talking about, you know, if you do radiation, we wouldn't expect an instantaneous change uh, in the cells, but we're seeing VT episodes change pretty quickly you know, in other studies as well. So that doesn't really make sense. Uh, when they've done sort of dog models and did you know, biopsies and autopsies and looked at the heart, there's not really scarring to explain because when we do catheter ablation, we're turning those border zones into actual dense scar, but that's not what's being seen. Um, so I, I think, you know, the question of does it work is still relevant because I, I think we really need to, uh, you know, understand is it doing and what is it doing? Uh, again, the long-term complication risk is maybe minimal on the current patients we're doing, but if we start expanding, it becomes relevant. And there's lots of questions, you know, how do we combine all the data from the different sources together? You know, how do we, you know, things are not ECG gated at this present because uh, you know, that never had to be. So how do we ECG gate things? Uh, and even the dosing, right? Is it good to give one dose? Should we give lower dose? Is it multiple doses? Um, and this requires the involvement of a lot of people. Uh, actually, I should say Nick made the slide. I, mean, I 
I'm amazed he made it. I thought he copied out of something, but it's that would have been a lot of work. But I, I think it's a great example of, you know, there are so many different groups that need to be involved to make this happen, which is another limiting factor. I think we're lucky that geographically we're all in the same building. We can easily go over and collaborate, but you can see if we're in two different parts of the city, this is hard to do. Uh, so it does limit on what centers can actually achieve this. Uh, this is just a, a list of many of the people that have been involved, and I'm sure, you know, there's others I've, I've kind of left out. There's, um, it's it's really, you know, a project with a lot of people to make this happen. Um, although we only had three patients so far, we actually did get an award from the Department of Oncology for the Team Innovation Award for, for this project, which was kind of kind of great. Um, and uh, that's all I had, and uh, and thank you. Nick and Salma, do you want to come up for questions? Yeah, good, good question. So uh, obviously you guys can comment more too. So initially when we first started, you know, we we did sort of correspond with the WashU groups and say we have the most experience. And initially they also said they were very conservative. Um, but then they kind of felt that it was better to be a little bit more generous because for many patients, this is the last treatment option and you don't want to feel like you missed it. And Nick kind of pointed out when we were talking on our second patient, we were a bit cautious and you wonder if maybe that's why the reduction wasn't, you know, as impressive. Um, the flip side, Andrew, is we actually sometimes get patients with really big scars too. And then we kind of realize we can't target the whole scar. That's why you need to sort of get a, some ideas about the VT morphology and exit. So you kind of target, you know, parts of the scar that are that are relevant. General extrapolating from radio surgery in the brain, except for the star, the, the target volume does relate to toxicity. So definitely it's sort of that finding that balance of making sure we get a therapeutic effect, but at the same time, it might be um, more toxic to be supported. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, you know, we're limited by who shows up, but you know, because of the the selection process, so to speak. Um, I, I think we have to be realistic, right? It's not truly ECG gated. We're tar probably targeting maybe more or less than what we think. So, I mean, I think if we start fine tuning the process, then, you know, for sure. I think there's some interest even from the amount of factors to have ECG gating and things. Yeah, yeah. So, gating is the uh, uh, basically trying to, to, to match the, the radiation beam delivery to the frequency of the heart, like beating, right? So, so lots of technical difficulty to do that. So I know there's some group that's been looking into it, but uh, uh, this definitely is not something we're able to do right now. So, but uh, so to add to what uh, Vikas and Sam had said, we had like I don't know if you saw, but on one of my slides, you, we had a margin, right? So they, actually the volume is even bigger than what the scar is, uh, this safety margin. So uh, and like uh, this two to three millimeter line that we add to the to the volume, like actually like. So yeah, so those volume are like quite significant, actually. Uh, hi, Wilson. Thanks for typing the comment uh, in the chat. And just uh, it says, uh, can you comment on how you define the target and if PET slash MR can help in the future? And in terms of target definition, uh, usually uh, at the time of planning, we'll have a meeting with uh, cardiology, radiology, and physics. We'll all sit in the same room. We'll use anything we have, including ECG data, uh, which will be translated into the 17-segment uh, model. Uh, and of course, radiology will identify any imaging changes. And then sort of as a collaborative effort in, in that hour or so, we'll, we'll sort of come up, come up with the target, which will be fine-tuned later. In terms of if PET or MRI can help in the future, I'll let you comment on whether you think that's... Uh... Yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly possible. The MR limitations are always, you know, partly to do with sort of the ICD and artifact, especially if they're not MRI conditional. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's one of the things, right? We probably need to fine-tune, you know, what is the imaging data we can use and how do we integrate it? Um, Andrew Mardell asked, is the, yeah, do you see change in EF improvement or reduction uh, over which window of time? You know, so far, no. And it's certainly in our local study, that is something we're carefully looking at. 
uh, because, you know, as Andrew and probably many of you know, even when we first started doing catheter ablation, that was a concern that can you change the EF because you're doing a lot of um, ablation. And the catheter ablation scenario, because you're usually ablating scar areas, they were never mechanically contributing. I mean, we're hoping it'll it'll be the same, but but again, you know, nothing so far, but it probably hasn't been studied in that much detail either. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's sort of like a European kind of registry kind of survey kind of stuff happening. Maybe that'll have it, but part of the issue is, you know, if you're doing things as a compassionate care, you're not really following up on that data. And that's kind of why we wanted to do it differently because, you know, like some centers in Canada, they do the treatment, but they do, you know, they do clinical follow-up, but they don't really do a lot of imaging follow-up. They're kind of thinking, well, you know, this is compassionate care. We don't really need to so that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do as a study. I mean, we know it's not going to be a landmark study. It's a few patients, but I think we, at least for ourselves, we wanted to be sure that, you know, we're sort of tracking things. Um, Yeah, so, yeah, good question. So I, I know, so the group in WashU is trying to start a randomized study. Mostly it's been in the US they're targeting. Um, the initial version, which Russell would know, but others may not. So some centers use what's called a ECG vest uh, to help with this. So you can put the patients in VT and it gives you some surface idea of where the VT might be coming from. You know, how helpful that is, is I mean, to me, I don't think it's super clear and it's super, it's a quite an expensive um, technology. It's about two to 300,000 up front, about 5,000 per vest. So most centers in Canada and Europe don't have access to that. Um, so I think the study they were doing kind of required that as part of the, the entrance criteria. So that's why, you know, we haven't, um, but I know they're also struggling to get centers involved because just because, you know, the environment in some of the US centers, they're not keen to give up procedures to other, other groups and things like that. Um, and Brian had a question here. What is the anticipated annual number of patients? Uh, it's a good question, Brian. I, I mean, it, you know, because we started during COVID, everything's been kind of kind of tough for any sort of recruitment. Um, looking at my sort of VT ablation, kind of catheter ablation data, and you know where people end up, I, I would guess that, you know, we're probably looking at maybe you know anywhere from, you know, two to three patients probably on average. I mean, there's obviously variation. For one year, you might have five, and one year you might have like you know one or something. So. Um, Oh, um, do we, sorry, the next question was, um, do we observe patients for a few hours after radiation within the facility or do we, how do we uh, post our care? Yes, it's a good question. So I think the first patient we actually admitted overnight because we were all kind of freaked out as to what was happening. Um, I mean, nothing happened, obviously. And then we also talked to other centers and we kind of realized that you know, probably don't really need to do that. Uh, we do check their defibrillator after, before, and then they come back a few days after as well. Um, so. I mean, it's it's a pretty amazing when you convert a catheter ablation, which is you know eight hours. Sometimes you need a pre-admission, post-admission, um, and sometimes if they have hemodynamic issues after GA and ablation, they end up in hospital for a few days. And you know these patients come in, it takes about an hour for the procedure, and then they go back home. So that's uh, that's pretty amazing uh, that way. Yeah, no, we we had lots of discussion on this, and we we all th thought the safest thing was to leave it as it is, uh, because you know if they do have VT or something during the procedure, you know the ICD is going to be the best at detecting and treating it instead of you know trying to call a code or you know whatever would be required. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, and do you anticipate progressing to treating non-palliative patients? Yeah, good question. I think right now, you know, probably not. You know, evidence for that. I think that's where if we get more definite evidence that it does help, it becomes relevant. But then the questions of, you know, what is the prognosis for the patient and would they live long enough for other complications from radiation may be relevant also becomes a, becomes a concern. 